The late night roads of Appalachia instill a unique dread. There are the natural dangers, crooked, winding, unguarded roads that give way to hundred foot drops, wildlife that leaps into your path without warning, and weather that can obliterate entire towns in a matter of minutes. But anyone familiar with the back roads of Tennessee or Virginia knows that the far out fields and forests of the Southeast contain greater evils than that. Sure, the crisscrossing of well-trodden interstate highways may be safe enough, but when you're forced to turn down one of thousands of quiet rural paths winding their way through the remote hills and valleys, it's hard not to imagine what malevolent forces have made a home just beyond the reach of your high beams, be they man or monster. No one would ever know if something happened to you way out here. That's why the locals don't go out at night, at least. The well-meaning ones don't. Sarah Lewis had been taught these lessons in her youth. She abided by them for years until one day she left her home in the hills altogether. She grew up. She moved on. She forgot. Now, she would remember once more. 84%. Blue light flooded the cabin of Sarah's car. She'd been staring out at dark Virginian back roads for hours now, and the photons hitting her dry, tired pupils felt like a fistful of sand. <sighs> Eli, turn your brightness down. I'm trying to drive. I'm just trying to find a motel like you wanted. You're the one who used all her phone battery on music. Eli's fingers danced on his screen, and the car grew dim, but there was no saving the rods in Sarah's eyes. Night vision ruined. She threw on the high beams and squinted out into the pitch wash over the winding road, trying to keep sight of her lane. The sides of the road were dotted with crooked chain-link fences guarding unkempt fields full of rusted junker cars. The same sights had been keeping them company since they had turned off the interstate. A slight left turn set the couple's course towards a collection of red lights that climbed gradually higher into the sky. It was a massive radio tower, looming over them from a distant hill. The lights flashed and blinked rhythmically. Sarah thought it looked like a dozen crimson eyes looking down from space, watching over them. She chose to feel comforted by the comparison. Sarah's wandering hand grabbed a can from the cup holder between them, and she gulped down hyper-sweetened caffeine. A shiver skittered up her neck and under her scalp like little jagged beetle's legs getting tangled up in her hair. Somehow, her skin was both numb from exhaustion and tingling from the two empty cans in the back seat. This was what poor planning got them. It was all going to be okay, though. The gentle buzz-buzz of the phone's simulated keyboard tickled hairs deep in Sarah's ears. Soon, Eli would find them a motel, and it wouldn't be long before the sweet, sweet release of a cheap mattress. Preferably one without bedbugs. 82%. If we get in a wreck because I can't see, it's your fault. Can we please just make it one hour without an argument? They'd been bickering ever since they crossed the state line, almost three hours ago now. Some peace did sound nice. Sarah swallowed her pride. <sighs> How far's the motel? She waited, but there was no response. Eli? He was staring pointedly into the passenger side mirror. Huh? Oh, sorry, it's just... How long has that same car been behind us? I noticed it had been there for a while earlier and didn't want to freak you out or anything, but that was like two hours ago. I just realized it's still behind us. Sarah watched the car in her rearview mirror. She'd been so focused on the road. Um, I'm not sure how long he's been there. I never noticed it before. Well, whatever. It could be somebody passing through like us. Are you sure it's the same car? I think so. Eli, I'm sure it's nothing. You're probably right about them passing through like us. Let's just try to make it to the motel. How far away is it? Eli's eyes were still transfixed on the mirror, but he mumbled out a distracted response. Looks like the closest one's about an hour away. An hour? There has to be something closer. Nothing else shows up on my phone. I don't know though, Sarah. I don't really want to stop until we find out whether or not this guy's actually following us. Eli's phone lit his face from underneath. He was tired, and the odd lighting made his face look even more grim. He said that he didn't want to scare her, but Sarah could tell that he was getting nervous himself. She wanted to comfort him. 
Sarah eased the brake pedal down as she approached an upcoming turn. Wait, why are you slowing down? Chill, Eli. I'm just turning off here to let him pass us. No, no, Sarah, we don't know where that road goes. We could get trapped. Relax, Eli, you're safe. He isn't following us. Sarah swung the car to the right and steadily began to roll down the dusty gravel side road. Neither she nor Eli watched where they were going. All four eyes were glued to mirrors, watching for the moment when the car would pass behind them and on its way. The moment never came. The other car bounced and shook on the rough road as it slowly mimicked Sarah's turn and resumed its approach. Her mouth went dry. Eli looked at her with an expression of betrayal, but neither of them said anything. The junker that was following them was battered and beaten, as if it had been driven directly out of some hillbilly's ramshackle car lot a quarter mile back. The road ahead was split. The left path was a driveway that snaked up through the hills toward a distant barn, and the right hooked back to the west, where Sarah and Eli had come from. Sarah took the right, hoping that it would reunite them with the main road. Again, the same decrepit car came rumbling around the corner. Sarah floored it, speeding away from the old sedan as her tires threw rocks and dust into the air. She felt guilty now that she had dismissed Eli's concerns. 78%. Eli, I, I didn't mean to... It's okay. If he's really following us, we need to stay calm and find somewhere safe to stay. The motel? I... Sure, for now, just stay calm. It was obvious that Eli was talking to himself as much as Sarah. His fists were balled up tight in white-knuckled anxiety, and his leg bounced feverishly. Another turn came and went. The junker maintained its distance. Another turn, and Sarah and Eli were back on the main road, any illusion of safety dispelled in four short turns. I think... I think that if we can get off these back roads, they might leave us alone. I doubt they'll try anything in town. Are you sure? I don't know, I mean... They probably just... Sarah gasped. Her gaslight had just flickered on. Sarah? How far can we make it on that? Sarah stared in horror at the fuel gauge. Maybe another 30 minutes? Maybe. Sarah could practically hear Eli's teeth grinding together. They both knew that they wouldn't be making it anywhere near town. Okay, I'm calling the police. They were approaching the hill with the radio tower now. The gigantic tower rose higher than ever. Its crooked frame faded into view against the dark sky. Rusted metal bathed in warm red glow as its lights came to life, then died once more. Eli slammed his fist against the dashboard. Of course there's no signal out here. What's the point of the stupid radio tower if you can't even get a call through? Just keep trying. Maybe once we get further up the hill, we can get a connection. Sarah harbored the barest modicum of hope. She'd grown up in a town just like this, and that entire region was basically one big dead zone. Folks this far out weren't worth the effort of reaching. The road began to twist its way up the hill in switchbacks that made Sarah feel sick to her already shaken stomach back and forth, back and forth, before wrapping around the crest of the hill and dipping down towards a large open basin on the other side. The SUV's high beams shined out over it, revealing an expanse of dark dirt roads. They formed a rough grid, like barren city streets devoid of the light, life, and safety that a town might have offered. Dotted around the edges of the valley were more hills and radio towers, just the same as the one that Sarah and Eli were about to pass under. Dozens of crimson eyes suddenly turned into hundreds of beady little things. In light of the circumstances that Sarah and Eli now found themselves in, Sarah no longer found the oversight comforting. However, down in the center of the depression, civilization burned through the night. Gas station floodlights. Hope. It was awfully far away, but the pit in Sarah's stomach began to disappear. Look, I think we might be able to make it there before we run out of gas. Are you sure? It seems pretty far. 73%. The car passed under the tower. The dark sky was washed white and red like a slurry of milk and blood. Sarah's entire body went limp and she slumped sideways. She managed to maintain a grip on the wheel, 
but the whole world went blank and her head thudded painfully against the window. Then she snapped upright. What? What had just happened? Had she blacked out? Fallen asleep? Sarah briefly entertained the idea that they had just been struck by lightning. Her head felt like she was swimming up from the bottom of a very deep pool, and she found herself much further down the road than she had been just a few moments ago. Sarah turned to make sure Eli was okay and saw his phone on the seat, the still open GPS app quietly giving directions. Eli? She half expected a response from the empty space above the seat, as if he had simply turned invisible. But he was just gone. Hot and cold fought on the surface of Sarah's skin, as nervous chill conflicted with burning fear and adrenaline. She ripped her attention away from the dim phone, just in time to swerve, avoiding a plunge off the side of the hill. Her heart beat against her ribs. How could this be possible? Did Eli jump out of the car? No, there wasn't any sound of the door opening, and why would he? But he couldn't have simply vanished. She needed to help, but could Sarah really bring herself to turn around and go looking for him? If she did, it would be an easy task for their pursuer to block the narrow road. Never mind the growing uncertainty that she could make it to the gas station before the car ran dry. Sarah wanted to scream. She did. There were two options. Turn back and confront her pursuer in the hopes that she might help Eli. Or calm down, try to get to the gas station, and try to get in touch with somebody who might actually be able to help. I'm, I'm sorry, Eli. I, I can't. As awful as the situation was, it would only get worse if she tried to deal with it alone. Her hand shot over to Eli's phone. 72%. It had plenty of battery life. That was good. She might be exhausted and running out of gas, but at least she had battery. Come on, come on. Please be a signal out here. 911, what is your emergency? The dispatcher's voice was strikingly clear, but Sarah's head was still swimming. Um... My name is Sarah Lewis, and I think I'm in danger. I'm being followed by another car. Okay, you're being followed. Are you sure? My friend and I... Yes, I'm, I'm sure. Ma'am, are you alone? Is, is there anyone else near you? The dispatcher's voice became distorted with static as Sarah drove down the hill. The signal on the hill was already getting weaker. Even so, the headlights were still behind her, shining like two big predator's eyes. She sped up. Alone? I, I think so. I, I just... Ma'am, I need you to stay calm and answer a few important questions for me, okay? Where are you? What road are you on right now? It hadn't occurred to Sarah that she didn't know what the road was called. She wasn't even sure roads like this had names. I, I don't know. We got off I-81 a ways back, but... We? I thought you said you were alone. Ma'am, is there someone else? <laughs> The call failed. Sarah screamed at the phone, but hastily dialed 911 again. I'm sorry. The person you are trying to reach is not available. Please leave a message or try again. What? She hung up and dialed again. After a moment of silence, the phone started to ring. So there was a signal, but it was almost as if... I'm sorry. The person you are trying to reach is not available. Please leave a message or try again. It was as if the dispatcher was hanging up on her, sending her to voicemail. 70%. Are you kidding me? You're 911. You have to pick up. Call after call after call. The operator never picked up the phone again. Sarah's stomach churned. She didn't want to be alone. Maybe... Maybe her parents would answer. Sorry, the person you are trying to... Sarah hung up and screamed and swore. She pounded her fist on the steering wheel so hard it would cause a bruise. Still, no one answered her cries for help. 65%. She took several deep breaths. Okay. Okay. No sense draining the battery. If there was no signal, she would stop calling. She couldn't make it work. But she could make it to the gas station better to put her energy into doing what she could rather than what she couldn't. What if I can't do either? The treacherous thought repeated in her mind. 
She was very nearly to the bottom of the hill now, and the glow of cheap floodlights was visible above a distant tree line. There was nothing to do but drive. So Sarah went out across the valley, navigating the grid of ditches and unpaved roads. The dirt was soft and smooth, causing her car to rumble gently. The murderously pleasant vibrations threatened to carry her off to sleep, and likely into one of the ditches. Sarah tried to get her mind onto something, anything to keep her focused and awake. She began looking for wildlife that might be wandering the quiet valley, but it was dead, dark, and silent as far as the eye could see. It was strange to be so far out and to see the sky so barren, like the stars themselves had retreated up behind a great blanket of night. The sky used to be beautiful out here, but now it was just as flat as the city sky she'd grown accustomed to. All around her, it was just so... dark. There was nothing. Absolutely nothing. Even her own headlights seemed to fade away. There was a tremendous thud, and Sarah's eyes shot open. Dirt roads had given way to something that looked like it had been paved long ago. She must have hit a pothole. In some strange sense, she was thankful that the road was in such poor condition. How could she have dozed off? Headlights still shone behind her, but the hypnotic crisscrossing of country roads and the overwhelming darkness were dangers unto themselves. Just a little further. Just a little further. Just ahead, a turn on the right snaked up into the tree line towards the inviting glow of the gas station. Sarah steered into the forest and watched in her rearview mirror, waiting for the familiar sight of the headlights to follow her. When the battered car passed the turn without altering course, it was like a hundred bricks had been lifted from her shoulders. (laughs) Yes! Yes! At least some small part of her expected to see the car back up and come careening down the road towards her, but it never did. She kept checking the rearview mirror every few seconds, but now she was totally alone. No more Eli. No more Pursuer. Sarah Lewis was all alone at the bottom of a valley, deeper and darker than she could possibly comprehend. Sarah's relief was short-lived. If they weren't being followed, had she just left Eli up on that hill for no reason? He could be seriously hurt. She needed to go back and help, but a glance at the gas gauge confirmed that making it back up to the radio tower like this wasn't an option. She checked the rearview mirror once again, again, again. She didn't trust that the nightmare was over yet. The gas station parking lot was, in actuality, quite dim. A few foggy floodlights illuminated the area around the pumps, just enough for Sarah to find a place to park. It took some effort to leave the safety of the car, and when she did, the door stayed open. Nothing would get between herself and a fast escape. Even the gas station was quiet. There were other cars in the lot. One was even parked at another pump. But there was an absolute absence of life. The lights overhead hummed faintly, but no bugs swarmed around them. What is wrong with this valley? Sarah checked Eli's phone. 1 a.m., 62%. Maybe someone inside would be kind enough to help her look for him. The glass storefront afforded little cover to anyone searching for snacks or dozing off behind the counter but at least it was possible that some helpful stranger was tucked away in a corner. She pulled the door open, stepped inside, and the quiet chime of a digital bell announced her presence to no one. It was colder inside the store than she expected, and goosebumps broke out on her arms. Hello? She listened carefully for the sounds of an employee rustling around in a broom closet or restroom, but the only sounds filling the store were the constant whir of refrigerator fans and the lackadaisical country tune playing on a cheap radio. Quiet as it was, it felt nice to be in a well-lit room and to hear something besides road noise. She wandered behind the counter, checking for an attendant, but there was just an empty chair. She helped herself and began to weigh her options. Was it best to just wait here for somebody to help her look for Eli? The locals might know the hillside, and she wasn't very keen to wander around alone in the dark. That said, the idea of waiting in this valley, even in the gas station filled Sarah with dread. Once, at her childhood home, she watched a squirrel crawl into the crook of an old tree to hide from a hawk. Right now, it was hard to forget the sounds the shrieking rodent made as it was ripped from the hollow and picked apart. Would help really come? She put the decision down to a call. Hi, 
I'm sorry. The person you are trying to... That settled it. With no guarantee that help was on the way, the best option was to get out of here as soon as possible. Sarah put enough gas on her pump to fill the tank, grabbed an energy drink from the fridge, and slapped every bill she had down on the counter. She'd almost certainly ever paid, but didn't want to feel like she'd stolen from a small-town business just because she was paranoid. 60%. I'm sorry. The people you are trying... Driving out of the woods took a bit longer than Sarah expected, but she finally emerged under the flat black night sky. It was even more unnerving after leaving the gas station sanctuary, but a little bit of time on her feet had also helped Sarah to feel awake and alert. She could do this. Eli would be safe and sound on the hill, and they would leave the valley behind together. But which hill had she come down? Sarah thought she remembered how to get back, but the radio masts surrounding the basin made every direction look more or less the same. She would just have to retrace her steps, one at a time. So, first up, had she turned left or right into the woods? It had been... It had certainly been a right. But that road looked totally unfamiliar. Rather than worn pavement under clear skies, a densely overgrown swath of limbs covered a dirt road that suddenly wound into the woods behind her. Sarah cautiously turned down the other path. She hoped that she would be able to recognize the scenery around the route she had taken as she got closer to the mountains. But it seemed like no matter how far she drove, the distant radio towers remained distant. How long had it taken to cross the valley before? Certainly no more than 20 minutes, otherwise she would have run out of gas. But according to the digital clock on her dashboard, she'd been driving back towards the radio tower for nearly an hour. An hour! That didn't make any sense. Sarah flew past another intersection, and panic took hold once again. It would have been less alarming if every window on the car had shattered at once. There, on the side road, with its headlights off, was the other car. It had been waiting there for her. No, it was a different vehicle. It must be different. But it wasn't. It was the car. Sarah's headlights had only for a moment, revealed the rusted sedan from its hiding place in the night. The peeling red and green oxidation on the side of the car was unmistakable. What's more, Sarah had gotten her first look at the driver. As she had passed by, her high beams had reflected off the scalp of a tremendously bald man. The shining dome could have been mistaken for a light bulb, a grotesquely oversized, bulbous sort of head, or perhaps two heads. It seemed as though there might have been two men inside the car. She had passed it so quickly it was hard to tell. Whatever, that didn't matter anymore. As soon as she passed the other vehicle, she heard the Junker's engines roar to life behind her and the squeal of melting tires against the well-worn road. Sarah very nearly shoved her foot through the floor. She wasn't being followed. She was being chased. Then, the phone next to her began to ring. Now? Her already pounding heart threatened to split her chest open. Adrenaline shook her hand violently, but she managed to snap the phone from the passenger seat and answer it. I'm sorry. The people you are trying to reach. I'm. I'm. You are trying. You are trying to reach. I'm. The voice on the other end became distorted. It continued to repeat the phrase, though it only half sounded like the voice from the answering machine now. What? She tried to hang up, but the call refused to terminate. She pressed the button again. End. 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 Nothing happened. Oh, great. Yeah, that's about right. She threw the phone back down. What a wonderful turn of events. Now Eli's phone, her one and only lifeline, was broken. She considered looking for a tree to wrap the car around. The car's interior suddenly grew brighter and brighter. It took Sarah a moment to realize that the light was coming from Eli's phone. The screen had become blindingly bright like a little sun right there in the cabin of her SUV. It began to get louder. I'm sorry. Louder. I'm sorry. It was so loud that Sarah thought the speaker was going to blow out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sarah Lewis, go left. She flew past another road. 
She was going nearly 80 miles an hour on a very narrow, very dusty road, so she didn't dare try to make the turn. Didn't even notice it, for that matter. She was too stunned by the fact that the phone had just used her name. No, it, it hadn't just used her name. It had spoken to her. Wrong way. I'm sorry. Just like that, the light inside the car vanished, and Sarah could only hear the sounds of her engine and the junker roaring behind her. They both seemed quiet now, by comparison to the words coming from the phone. Without questioning it, Sarah reached back to the phone desperately. She took several quick glances down at the call history while trying to maintain control of the vehicle. The last call had come from no number at all, just a blank space where the number should have been. She pressed redial anyway. The phone rang for a few moments before the answering machine picked up again. I'm sorry. The person you are trying to reach is not available. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sarah had to scream to even hear herself, but it was no use. The voice on the other end only persisted in its distorted apologies. Steadily, the screen grew brighter and the voice grew louder. It was so loud that the steering wheel shook. Finally, the I'm sorry ceased, and with a voice like a crack of lightning, it spoke to her once more. Sarah Lewis, go left. This time, Sarah immediately slowed down. About 40 feet ahead of her, past an outcropping of ragged bushes, her headlights revealed a road. She was going too fast to make the turn, but she took it anyway. She swerved to the left, and her tires slid across the dirt like she was driving across oiled glass. They spun uselessly, frantically searching for traction. Finally, rubber bit down and took hold, and Sarah's car snapped forward down the new road. Sarah Lewis, good job. Go straight. The phone seemed to grow even brighter and louder. Sarah could feel the jelly in her eyes vibrating. It wasn't speaking, but it was like she could hear the light itself ringing deep within her ears, like an orchestra of bells playing the most brilliant crescendo ever composed. It was both terrifying and comforting. Would it keep getting louder after every turn? It was so loud now that Sarah couldn't even hear her pursuer's engine. Maybe she was just going crazy. There were plenty of signs, after all. But she thought that the radio tower, perched high on a hill ahead, had suddenly gotten closer. Sarah Lewis, go left. The road forked off ahead of her in two directions. She took the left road. The ringing got louder, the screen got brighter, and the radio tower got closer. 55%. Sarah hardly cared about the noise or the blinding light anymore. As long as the voice on the phone kept taking her closer and closer to the mountain, she would follow its commands. Sarah gunned it through several more intersections. With each crossroad, she expected to hear the voice commanding her to go left or right, but it stayed silent. Well, not silent, it sounded like the world was ending. But the steady vibrations of her car's overworked engine kept her grounded in reality. It was an extraordinarily draining task to keep control of the vehicle. She was making her way out of the valley, but one wrong move at this speed would send her off the road and into one of the barren fields that separated one street from another. She didn't dare slow down, however. She was sure that the junker was still behind her, barreling through the night, somehow keeping right on her tail, despite its headlights being off. She really hoped that they would miss one of the turns, and end up dead in a ditch behind her. But something told her that wasn't going to happen. Sarah Lewis, go right. Sarah slammed on the brakes just in time to make the turn. Her tires burned on a freshly paved road, but the squeals were entirely inaudible over the glorious music emanating from the phone. The interior of the car was so bright that it began to illuminate a five-foot patch around the car itself. The intense light should have made it impossible for Sarah to see. But she could now make out her surroundings more clearly than she had for hours. It was strange to see such a pristine blacktop out here in the midst of the endless grid of dirt. But she didn't even question it at this point. The road here was wider, and it emboldened her to drive even faster. From outside the car, it must have been quite the sight. Like a shooting star blazing across the night sky, she shot across the valley at almost 90 miles per hour. It felt incredibly unsafe. It was unsafe. But she was getting so close to the base of the hill. The nightmare was almost over. Thankfully, Sarah was able to continue on this road for nearly half an hour before she received further instruction from the voice. When it spoke again, she nearly jumped out of her skin. Be not afraid, Sarah Lewis. Go right. After another extremely risky turn, Sarah looked up to see that the radio tower was nearly right on top of her. She was so close to the base of the hill. It was a straight shot, and then she would be winding up the road to the crest. 
the road around her was bathed in light now. Her high beams barely reached the bottom of the hill. Determined to get out of the valley as fast as possible, Sarah sped up. No, Sarah Lewis, you must slow down. You must turn right. Sarah could see a road that peeled off to the right, just as the voice had said. But... But that road was leading away from the hill. No, she needed to trust herself. She continued to speed up. She could practically feel the junker gaining on her. It was impossibly fast. You must turn right. You must turn right. You must turn right. The voice was so loud, Sarah felt like her teeth would fall out. But in that moment, her fear was even louder. She could only remember the shrieks of that squirrel from her childhood. The red splash as the hawk had pecked out its eyes. Sarah Lewis went the wrong way. Directly towards the hill towards the tower, towards Eli. Sarah, Sarah Lewis. Lewis. Wrong, wrong way. way. I'm, I'm sorry. Fifty percent. She was only about thirty feet from the incline leading her up the hill. She pressed down even harder on the pedal. It was close, but it felt as though she was driving through a vat of honey. No matter how much she sped up, she was only crawling towards the hill, and then crawling away from it. The road in front of her stretched out. Space warped in front of Sarah, and the hill retreated into the distance once again. Everything grew darker and darker, and then it was all dark and silent once again. As light faded from inside the car, several hours of driving caught up to Sarah in an instant and once again she had to fight to stay awake. She drove forward in disbelief for a few minutes before she finally realized that the sound of the engine behind her was completely gone. The junker had stopped following her once again. When had it given up? No, no, that didn't matter right now. She was drained and defeated. What was she supposed to do? Call the number back and start the drive all over again? She couldn't do it. She didn't have the energy. Right in the middle of the road, Sarah slowly brought the car to a stop. She missed the music. She missed the light. But if darkness was all she had in this moment, then she would use it to her advantage. She drove off the road and out into one of the dry, dead fields that covered most of the valley. Click. She turned off her headlights and sat in the perfect, empty abyss. Maybe out here. Maybe they wouldn't find her in the darkness. There was nothing to give away her position, and maybe that would buy her an hour, no, half an hour of sleep. She turned the keys, but left them in the ignition. The rumbling of the engine stopped. Now, it was really silent. She closed her eyes and drifted away into nothing. Sarah felt better. Much better. How long had she slept? She opened her eyes, but nothing changed. That was good. That meant it was night and she was still hidden. In the dark, she fumbled for Eli's phone. When her fingers bumped against the hard edge of the smartphone, she picked it up and turned on the screen. The shining digital display stung her eyes, but after a moment her sight adjusted. Her whole body tensed. How could that possibly be correct? Sarah tried to look out the windshield, but it was utterly pitch black. She checked the phone screen again. 10 a.m. How could it still be night? What was worse was that she had slept for nearly seven hours, and her most precious resource was running dangerously low. Ten percent. Stay calm. Stay calm. I can get out of this. I nearly did it before. I can do it again. She navigated to the call history once more. She was eager to hear the thunderous melody of her guiding light. Soon, she wouldn't be alone. Just a few taps 
and the rumbling would be replaced by music once more. Her fingers froze on the surface of the screen. Rumbling. Nine percent. Sarah's keys jingled in the dark, and with a turn, the hum of her engine harmonized with another. Click. Her headlights turned back on. Directly in front of her was the junker, facing her head on. The bald man she had seen earlier was in the driver's seat, staring at her. His face was round and fat, without a single trace of hair on his head. No beard, no eyebrows, no eyelashes. As far as Sarah could tell, he was entirely unclothed. His skin was so pale and thin that it was almost translucent. Sarah could make out the faint lines of blood vessels under the surface. His eyes were dark and sunken, as if he were severely dehydrated. Sweat poured down his face and bare chest, making it appear slick and slimy. Eight percent. Next to him, sitting in the passenger seat, was another man with an almost identical face. No, it was identical. Sarah desperately started to shift gears. Run, run, run. Every fiber of her being screamed at her to run. Behind the two men was another. And another. And another. 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 There must have been thirty. Fifty. Hundreds? The cabin of the vehicle was so full of faces that Sarah could do nothing but run. Every last one of them was a carbon copy of every other. That same slick-looking flesh seemed to fill up the entire car. As Sarah's tires spun in the mud, she stared deeper. She desperately wanted to look away, but it was like looking at a fractal. The longer she looked, the more men she saw. She could make out thousands of naked, pudgy faces now, glaring back at her with blank expressions that somehow conveyed supreme malice. No matter how much gas she gave the car, she couldn't unstick herself from the soil. The junker simply sat in front of her. Millions of wicked faces within defied all logic. That wasn't a car in front of Sarah. It was a black hole of hatred. Immeasurable spite compressed into a tiny area and constantly ascending to greater degrees of infinity. Could there actually be so many of them? Or was this just what it was like to look at the one man sitting in the driver's seat? There was the distinct sense of looking at something singular, but there was also a plurality hidden behind the face. There were trillions now. Eli's phone rang. Sarah kept her foot on the gas, but she quickly snatched up the phone and answered. Light filled the car, as bright as it had ever been before, and the listless expressions inside the junker contorted with anger. Sarah Lewis, drive. The SUV lurched out of the mud, and Sarah sped back towards the road. She hit the edge of the field and launched back up onto the street. She fought to keep the car on the road as her front two wheels returned to the ground. Then the back half of the vehicle slammed down and sent painful tremors through Sarah's spine. Sarah Lewis, go right. As soon as she recovered from the shock of the impact, everything but obedience cleared from Sarah's mind. This was how she would escape. Six percent. Behind her, in the field, the junker's engine roared to life. The cacophony of burning gasoline and firing cylinders was so much louder now. It had taken on a more animalistic sound. Sarah was sure of it now. The phone and the junker. They weren't simply machines. They were alive. The junker's headlights flipped on once again, and it gave chase. There was a discernible hunger in the way it moved now, speeding up and nearly colliding with Sarah's back bumper, like a lion chasing a gazelle. Did it intend to run her off the road? She drove faster. Faster. She could outrun it. Five percent. The phone guided her through several more turns. Left, right, left, right. Slow down here. Now speed up. Stop. Stop? No, the phone hadn't commanded her to stop. At the next intersection, there was a red light. The first that Sarah had seen in the valley. Did... Did that mean she was free? Speed up. You cannot stop. You are not safe. Sarah began to slow her pace. She crept towards the light. She didn't want to make it out of this nightmare just to be obliterated by a speeding 18-wheeler. 
Speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up. In a flash, the interior of the car grew white hot. The phone burst into flames beside her, and the car windows exploded outwards. Cold, fast air filled the car, and Sarah's hair whipped at her face. A storm of flames and broken glass engulfed Sarah, but she was unharmed. The obliterated phone smoldered in the seat next to her like a chunk of burning magnesium, but the call continued. The fire was blinding, but Sarah could see all the way to the hill in front of her, the billions upon billions of miles that separated her from it, an expanse that she could never traverse without the aid of whoever it was that had called her. She looked closer to the intersection in front of her and realized why the phone had become so bright. It was trying to save her. On the right, an ambulance barreled down the road towards her, swerving left and right as though the driver were severely inebriated. The rear doors hung open, and what appeared to be dozens of small pebbles spilled out. No, not pebbles. Teeth. Human teeth. Sarah could see now that the cabin of the ambulance was completely filled with the little cream-colored bits of bone, so many that they were overflowing out the back. To her left, a low-riding pickup truck skidded down the road. Matted tufts of hair, the least of which being no less than 25 feet long, poured out of the windows and completely buried two large lumps in the bed of the truck. Sarah realized that the lumps were, in fact, two vaguely human-shaped creatures. As the hair whipped in the wind, she could see their pink mouths open, screaming. One of the truck's wheels was missing a tire, and scraping metal sent up a shower of sparks. The sparks had evidently ignited the dirty locks at some point, and now flames crept up the ends of the long mats towards the two writhing, wailing passengers in the truck bed. The smell of burning hair filled Sarah's nose, and she choked down vomit. With new understanding, Sarah finally relented to the caller. She pressed down on the pedal with all her might. Butterflies raced through her stomach as she passed between the two cars. The junker slowed down and made space for the other two vehicles to fall in behind her, a wolf respecting the seniority of two elder hunters. These vehicles made the rusted and beaten junker look like a fine new sports car. They were ancient, as though they predated the very concept of the automobile by millennia. Paradoxically, they were faster than the Junker had ever been. But Sarah was faster too. 3%. Sarah Lewis, go left. She obeyed and turned directly towards the radio tower. Her surroundings were a blur now. She traveled a thousand miles in a second and the tower crawled closer. Her speedometer spun wildly in place, completely incapable of measuring Sarah's unthinkable acceleration. The light of the phone supernaturally illuminated the valley around her. It should have been impossible to see where she was going. It was impossible. But Sarah knew that she wasn't really seeing anymore. Not in the same way that she had seen for the rest of her life. Pure understanding poured into her mind from the being on the other side of the call. A truer perception than she had ever known before. Sarah Lewis, go right. Obedience. Brighter. Louder. Faster. More crossroads. More vehicles joined the hunt. A hearse dragging an oozing coffin that left behind a red smear, a fire truck covered in eyes, a motorcycle whose rotting rider was tied in place with a tangle of barbed wire, a legion of horrors clad in iron and gorged upon fire and gasoline screamed along behind her. Another right. Brighter. Louder. Faster. 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 Photons stretched into eternity all around her as if she were driving through a tunnel. Sarah refused to look in her mirror, but she knew what was behind her. An incalculable array of headlights, more numerous than stars in the sky, pursued Sarah like a ravenous galaxy, an entire universe set upon her destruction. Sarah Lewis, you are approaching the final turns, but you are holding back. Be not afraid. If you do not speed up, I do not know if you will make it. Speed up? Speed up? It was complete nonsense. Sarah looked out the hole that used to be the driver's side window. She was traveling. She didn't know how fast she was traveling. It was horrifying moving at such a pace. How could she possibly move faster? But... But she chose to trust the voice on the phone. What else was there to do? The only way she could still be alive at this speed was if the caller was protecting her, and her intuition was the reason she was still stuck in this valley. She let go of fear. She pressed down against the already floored pedal, willing the vehicle to go faster. It, too, obeyed. Sarah Lewis, go left. She did. 
The two of them traversed a billion miles in an instant. The radio tower loomed overhead. She understood now. It was all about the tower. If she could make it there, she would be safe. Sarah Lewis, go right. Obedience. The tower expanded and surpassed all of existence. This was it, the very end. There was only one turn remaining. Would it be a left? A right? The phone speaker crackled. This was it. Please, please speak to me. Sarah Lewis, go. Zero percent. 8 a.m., October 29th. Drivers reported a gap in a guardrail near Blue Ridge Parkway. As police inspected further, it was discovered that a vehicle had gone through the guardrail and over the edge of the cliff. When teams attempted to reach the vehicle to provide aid to injured occupants, they discovered two bodies. A branch had penetrated the windshield, impaling the passenger and killing him almost instantly. The driver had been launched into the windshield, shattering her skull. They were identified to be Sarah Lewis and Eli Stevens. Back Road is a story about being lost and about having to lose yourself in an entirely different way to survive. I grew up on roads like this and they only got more terrifying as I got older and started to brave them for myself. A few years ago, on a drive just like this one, my wife and I became fixated on a single question. What if someone started following us out here? We considered how we would try to evade a pursuer and realized that it would be a pretty hopeless scenario. That's how the story of Back Road first came to be. Driving is such an underutilized idea in horror. It seems like being in a car should make you feel safe and secure. I mean, you're basically surrounded by a big metal cage, but I don't think I've ever felt completely safe in a car. We wanted to tap into all of the different fears that we had on our late night drives together. What if we were being followed turned into, what if we got lost? What if our phones went dead? What if you were falling asleep? What if you were all alone? And finally, what if morning never came? Naturally, the worst scenario would be to experience all these things at once. So, that's what Sarah had to endure. As for Sarah's fate in the back roads, well, who can say? Was that final turn a left or a right? Without knowing for sure, that only gives her a 50-50 shot of survival. The story leaves us with some questions, and that's by design. I could answer those questions for you right here, right now, but where's the fun in that? I can't really analyze my own story in the same way as somebody else's, so with that, I'll turn it over to you. What do you think happened to Sarah and Eli up on that hill? What was following them, and what was going on down in the valley? Who was calling Sarah? And of course, you also have to consider the fact of the dead bodies. Okay, I guess it's no fun if I don't give you something. So just know that this isn't the last time you'll see Sarah assuming that you like this story at all. To be honest, I've been sitting on back road for months now, tweaking it bit by bit. I can't really tell if it's good. Uh, I've written very few stories like this, and I've never put any of them out to an audience before, so I'm, I'm very excited to see what you guys think of it. Um, if you like it, you can expect to see more episodes of Panopticon featuring other horrors beyond the comprehension of man. I've got plenty of ideas for this to be like a interconnected horror anthology series, and I'd be pretty excited to share those with you guys as well, but if you don't want to see them, that's fine. This series was originally planned to be available exclusively to patrons and channel members, but as I worked on it more and more, I realized that I didn't really feel right locking it behind a paywall, so any additional episodes of Panopticon that I do will be free to everyone just like this one. Uh, if you'd still like to support the channel, I will leave a link to my Patreon down in the description. Uh, speaking of which, I would like to take a moment to thank all of my wonderful supporters. You literally keep this channel alive, and your support seriously means the world to me, so just thank you so, so much. And with that, I'm Cromudgeon. Thanks for watching. <laughs>